Foreign tourists are entitled to be baffled. The Tower of London, the crown jewels guarded by diminutive mercenaries from a distant shore. The keys. Who's key? Queen Elizabeth's keys. Pass Queen Elizabeth's keys. All's well. The grammar may be somewhat quaint, but the Gurkhas don't fight on syntax. Their legendary ferocity is matched only by their loyalty to our monarch. God preserve Queen Elizabeth. Aye. Their distant homeland is enshrined in stained glass at the Sandhurst Military Academy. The real thing is a noble mountain in the Annapurna range of the Himalayas. Nepal, spectacularly beautiful, pitifully impoverished. This is the Gurkha heartland, and to be born male here is to face a life of peasant drudgery. But there's one escape route. Boys like this, already toiling in the rice fields, will be among the many thousands who will compete to take it. It is to join the British Army. This is what they dream of and literally are prepared to die for. Ironically, in a changing world, their chances are becoming slimmer. Another Gurkha regiment, this time the 7th Duke of Edinburgh's own Gurkha rifles, is being stood down. The grief is evident. These are fighting men, many of whom would have chosen to fall in battle rather than be neutered by political defence cuts. But the backs remain ramrod straight as the cookeries, half knife, half sword, are sheathed for eternity. It's a royal occasion. Prince Philip arrives to take the valedictory salute to the regiment that bore his title. Soldiers whose battle honours were redolent with wild bravery and unquestioned sacrifice. More than 200,000 Gurkhas fought for Britain in the First World War. 20,000 were killed or injured. In World War II, some quarter of a million took on the Germans at Tobruk and Monte Cassino and the fanatical Japanese in the Far East. They suffered 23,655 casualties. Most men are marching into oblivion. Four Gurkha regiments have been concertinaed into one, two-thirds of their number jettisoned. Yet courtesy prevails with the traditional floral farewell to Prince Philip, an anomaly explained by George MacDonald Fraser, novelist and military historian who fought alongside them in Burma. That was the curious thing about the Gurkha, these awfully happy, jolly, nice little men were the most terrible dangerous fighting men on the face of the earth. I mean, they were natural born killers. But Donald Fraser's celebrated fictional hero, Flashman, would have fainted at the outset of this Gurkha action against the Japanese. They went into a Japanese position. The ground in front of the position was littered with their rifles. They just dropped their rifles and went in with their cookeries. And it was discovered afterwards, when they were withdrawn, they didn't have a single round of ammunition among them. They had just fought the chaps hand to hand. I always thought it was a pretty clumsy weapon, but it suits the workers, obviously. It was a very fearsome thing, and I should think probably terrified the opposition more than any other weapon in the armory. Flashman would have been wise. The Gurkhas, 
brandishing their cookeries in this World War II footage were enough to put the fear of God into the godless. And then came the terrifying war cry. The Gurkhas are coming. In fact, it was the advance of the British in India early in the 19th century that was to forge an initially bizarre alliance. The East India Company's foot soldiery swept the entire subcontinent before them until they reached the Himalayan kingdom of Nepal. Nepal, still living in the Stone Age, was going to be a pushover, dozily compliant. No sooner had its population risen than it was ready to go to bed again. It was a desperate misjudgment. Bloated from steamrollering a huge subcontinent, they encountered the men from Gorkha, from which the Gurkhas take their name, uninformed that its inhabitants regarded war as sport. From this tiny mountain fort, the Gurkhas, led by Pirti Narayan Shah, had swooped into the valleys to occupy 700 frontier miles, harass India and invade Tibet. The advance of the British army didn't bother them at all. The clashes were probably unique in military history in that the British were soon to abandon their disparagement of native troops. The Battle of Kalunga, heavily outgunned, the Gurkhas fought almost to the last man, losing 520 warriors, but not before killing almost 800 British troops. An ensign who survived it wrote, run they would not, and of death they seemed to have no fear, though their comrades were falling around. It was a salutary put-down for patronising attitudes and was to lead to a remarkable alliance born of mutual admiration. After the battle, the British erected memorials to both sides, inscribing the Gurkha obelisk with the words, they fought in fair conflict like men and in the intervals of fighting showed us liberal courtesy. For the Gurkhas, life was never to be the same again their indomitable spirit, their stand-here-till-we-die philosophy had so startled their British opponents that their commander, General David Octoloni, said in effect, we must get these little bounders on our side. Pragmatically, the Gurkhas leader agreed that this was a jolly good idea. The British, he condescended, fought like lions. They're nearly as good as we are. And so was resolved a contract that was to put the Gurkhas under the aegis of the British Army for the next 180 years. The only change has been that they are now less exotically dressed. Chin up. Okay. Today's Gurkhas, to a man, come from the same Himalayan terrain, so barren and without future that recruitment into the British Army is the ultimate prize. So fierce is the competition that candidates have to submit to the indignity of being branded like cattle, albeit with indelible ink. This is to prevent the unsuccessful leapfrogging to the next recruitment outpost and applying again under a totally different name. Major Gordon Corrigan explains the qualities they're looking for. I suppose what we're looking for is physical and mental robustness, flexibility, intelligence, loyalty. It's actually quite easy to find those qualities amongst the Gurkhas because their own society is hierarchical. It's a society where respect is automatically given to elders, to parents. Gaka children do what their father tells them to do. Um, sadly, in our society, we stopped doing that a long time ago. It's a society where you are thrown back very much on yourself. There is no welfare state. A natural disaster is ever present. Earthquake, landslide, hailstorms, flooding, fire. Nobody is there to bail you out. You're thrown back on your own resources. And this produces a, a, a tough society. It produces a fatalistic society. Fatalism, if you're an infantry soldier, is a good thing to have because it means you don't worry too much about being shot. You are going to be shot or you aren't. And it is better to be shot gloriously 
uh, and have your name live on down the generations than it is to stay at home or to run away. Go! For almost a hundred years, the Gurkhas never fought outside India. But the 20th century was to bring two world conflicts. In the first, a plea from General Sir Ian Hamilton for them to help out at Gallipoli. I am very anxious, if possible, to get a brigade of Gurkhas, the type of man who will, I am most certain, be most valuable on the Gallipoli Peninsula. The scrubby hillsides on the southwest faces of the plateau are just the sort of terrain where these little fellows are at their brilliant best. Each little Gurk might be worth his full weight in gold at Gallipoli. Test number four, 52. Gallipoli, 1915, was a blood-chilling disaster. Thousands of Allied troops died, and senior heads rolled, including that of Hamilton himself. In a bitter disclaimer, he had praise for only one body of soldiers. It is Sir Ian Hamilton's most cherished conviction that had he been given more Gurkhas in the Dardanelles, then he would never have been held up by the Turks. Next. System number 20, 58.5. Selection tests for candidate Gurkhas have hardly changed down the years. Even here, back in 1928, supply outweighed demand. The only difference then was the preservation of the top knot, the sprite of hair by which a stricken Gurkha's god could haul him into some Nepalese Valhalla. Some eccentricities have always been acknowledged, such as a Gurkha's problem about running from A via B to C in straight lines. Once you come to this sort of flat area for running side, I think they've got a problem because they don't have a, such a sort of a, a good piece of land out here to do sort of a running in a flat area. They can't work on the flat. They can only operate on. Oh, hills. they can they can operate quite easily on up and down side, but it's very difficult for them to do the sort of running or any sort of physical fitness on the flat area side. Hey, look. Thank you very much. Bye. It's a dispiriting moment for the unsuccessful. Just six are going through to the next processing stage, but for the losers it's back to boring old Annapurna along Nepal's M1, the ancient spice road leading to Tibet. They remain trapped in a time warp, where the solitary hotel is not exactly the Himalaya Hilton, and only the animals appear pampered. For a dry martini, read Horlicks. But there's more to this place than meets the eye, and the reason is this man, Tal Bahadur Pun, who left here many years ago to join the Gurkhas. When eventually he returned, it was with the conviction that education is the key to life. He'd had none, only picking up rudimentary reading and writing when he joined the army. He came home determined that the village school should be extended, saying, he who is without education will finish last. His words, for an exemplary reason, carried weight. He is one of 26 Gurkhas to have been awarded the Victoria Cross, the highest of all military decorations, and indeed which takes precedence over honours such as Knight of the Garter or the Order of Merit. On June the 23rd, 1944, fighting with the six Gurkha rifles against the Japanese in Burma, he found himself alone after his section comrades had been killed. His citation reads, Rifleman Tulbahada seized the Bren gun and firing from the hip as he went, continued to charge on the heavily bunkered position in the face of the most shattering concentration of automatic fire directed straight at him. With the dawn coming up behind him, he presented a perfect target to the Japanese. He had to move 30 yards over open ground, ankle deep in mud, through shell holes and over fallen trees. Despite overwhelming odds, he reached the house and closed with the Japanese occupants. He killed four with his gun and three with his cookery. Still, the citation didn't tell it all. When relief finally arrived, this benign-looking gentleman acquired a flamethrower and incinerated a further 30 Japanese in a dugout. He regarded this as appropriate reparation. But there's something of which he is even prouder, which he insists on showing to the world. His VC carries influence with the Gurkha Welfare Trust, 
and by using it, he was able to install in his village a simple communal water tap. Paradoxically, only a few steps distant, there flows this river, highly photogenic but seriously polluted. Before the tap, every drop of drinking water had to be carried in from an uncontaminated source eight miles away. The beauty of this place is sorely compromised by a poverty that the Welfare Trust strives to alleviate from limited resources. Nepal is the fourth poorest country in the world. To give you an illustration of the deprivation, there's only one doctor to 20,000, a hospital bed to one to 9,000 people. There is no state welfare system apart from primary school, which is now being extended up to secondary school. And therefore, without any insurance scheme, without any welfare scheme, any hardship means that people become destitute, they can lose their homes, and all means of livelihood. And therefore, all our ex-servicemen, and indeed their dependents, look to us, the Gurkha Welfare Trust, to try and help them. The tap was a gift from the gods, not just to ex gurkhas but to entire communities. Forget splitting the atom or man's first step on the moon, this is reality. No more back-breaking, there-and-back treks for a cup of non-poisonous tea. Now it's only a matter of yards. The villages have nudged into the 20th century, and it's all down to the Gurkhas and the Gurkha Welfare Trust, which across the foothills of Nepal installs other new taps at the rate of 40 a year. From their forays into the hills, the Gurkha recruiting officers have selected the 700 candidates for further examination. They come to Pokhara. It's not exactly twin with Las Vegas, yet for most of them it's already the thrill of a lifetime. It's the first high street they've seen. Then suddenly the gates of a new planet open up before them. This is the Gurkha's recruiting depot, order from chaos. Now they are tantalizingly close to a career that will provide clothes, food, world travel. They're very conscious of the traditions they have to live up to. Our ancient Gorkhalis fight in, for British Army bravely. So they give their life, but they, they don't give up their hands, so I think. That's why this motto is given to Gorkhali. They don't give up till their life will go. They don't give up till they die. He's also well acquainted with the Gurkha's motto, even in English. It is better to die than to be a coward. This man is a Sherpa yak herder from the foothills of Everest. Not many Sherpas have Gurkha ambitions, so his main concern is how his family will react if he fails. Yes, his parents will uh, I mean, uh, be upset and I think, uh, they will be quite angry as well, he thinks. He's laughing now, but it's a serious matter. There are many Nepalese who regard being turned down by the Gurkhas as a disgrace on the entire family. Some rejects don't even go home again. Yes, he will be quite afraid, but even so, then he must go back to his village. The last lap to acceptance is rigorous and literally rock-strewn. A squad of Gurkhas once competed in a London marathon and finished hardly out of breath. It was a Sunday stroll compared with this. The competition is daunting. 57,000 initially applied to join the Gurkhas this year. 700 have reached this stage. Eventually just 153 will be chosen. The burden here is 45 pounds of stones. Tomorrow it will be increased to 75. Some find it disturbing that the elite of each generation leave to serve a foreign army. But not John Cross, an ex-Gurkha colonel who went back to live in Nepal and lectures at Kathmandu University. What we don't do 
Yes, we don't go into the mountains of someone else's country, take a fellow by the nose and say, you're going to be our soldier. It's entirely their volition. And whether it's hardship or the sense of adventure or because they can't get their act correct in their own country is of no concern to the recruiter who wants what he knows is good material. And if a Nepali, a high-ranking Nepali, for instance, might think it's wrong to give people to another country to fight, to lose blood, I can only tell you what Pandit Nehru, in his wisdom in the early 50s, said when the Indian Lok Sabha said, why should we have our country used as a passageway for these mercenaries going to the dreadful British army, etc.? And Pandit Nehru said, until the Nepalese can give a high, as high a standard in Nepal to the people the British recruit. Until that happens, I will let them through. <laughs> the 700 candidates have been whittled down to 400 and attention is palpable. This is prize day, but for fewer than half of them. This the final selection process is conducted outside the Gurkha's compound. This is to thwart any remonstrance by rejects who feel they've been unfairly treated. The winners might have come up in the national lottery, which, when their indelible markings have been verified, they have. They can't wait to get in. A few rip off their coats or cheap wristwatches to give to a less fortunate friend. The British Army will now provide. By Nepali standards, they're now rich, insulated for life against everything except the winds of war. <laughs> they will have fine uniforms and civilian clothes, good food, medical attention, and after 15 years, a pension. The passing into the compound is itself symbolic. Acceptance into an exclusive club, festooned with battle honours, renowned for bravery. A few of the rejected can rustle up that no hard feelings look. Well, maybe next year. Inside, there is frantic, in some cases perplexing, activity. Writing farewell notes to the relatives they won't see for at least three years. They don't spring from an acquisitive society, but if they believed in Christmas, this would be Christmas Day. Off come the battered thongs to be replaced by kit that for many will be the first words of English they'll ever speak. Vest PT Green. It can now be a puzzling world. There is, for example, the ultimate challenge of new technology, the shoelace. Everything is an exciting discovery, but can they imagine what lies ahead? It will change my life because we will get something from the British Army and we will serve them. I will help my family from poverty. That's what does he expect England to be like? What does he hope to see there? I think England is a very big city, big country. They are my big city. I like to see that cities. And I like to see that big buildings. In Nepal we don't have that kind of building. So I like to see that. The yak man already knows everything about England. Uh, he says England is a uh, two development country and he says it's very cold places. Just what you'd expect from a chap who comes from Everest. Is there anything he wants to see?
he says he says that uh, he would like to see the uh, how is in the England the animals, the animals, what kind of animals are there? Saudis, I mean yaks are milk. It's made of yeah by yaks. Milk. In case English restaurants don't come up to scratch, he's brought his own food. Yak's milk cheese, hard as marble, though it doesn't taste as good. Old Army Sweats will notice something missing here. No bawling, screaming or obscenity on the barrack square. There's a warm affinity between NCOs and men. The reason is that the men don't need to be motivated. They already are. The first time while I uh, raised to... Uh, training depot and my section commander was there I, but I didn't know and he called me up in a bad language and I was pleased, sur surprised yeah really surprised what sort of people are here who even don't know to how to speak to the people that is my friend <laughs> all the section commander they uh, they used to talk a uh, rude words that I know that word that's why <laughs> no exciting rude words yeah why do you think they did that? Uh, because uh, because uh, if they call, uh, if they don't use uh, root words, uh, they cannot. Uh, I mean, they, they cannot make soldier from the civilian. Equally, the British officers have to adapt to native Gurkha attitudes and customs. There's no place for patronising haughtiness. Full nudity when you're washing is not tolerated at all. Um, the boys, in fact, in fact, probably wash all the time with their swimming trunks on. Um, you never point at anyone at any time. If you're pointing, you have to use your thumb. Or if you're if you're pointing, someone asks you where something is. You'll see a lot of the Gurkhas pointing with their chin. Um, depending on how close or or far away that is, if if they're far away, they'll make a big gesture with their chin and if they're close they'll just jerk their head in their direction. Um, there are other ones. You, you would never ever touch any of your soldiers necks or shoulders um, because they believe that in Nepalese tradition if you touch someone else's neck or shoulders then you'll make them be ill. They'd probably get a goiter or something growing on their neck. If you do inadvertently touch someone's neck, or have to for a reason, um, to get rid of the evil spirit that you've put into them, you have to blow on your fingers, just a quick blow on your fingers afterwards. At the end of their basic training, a pandit administers the oath of allegiance. They're mercenaries, they have a king of their own, and yet there's no more solemn moment in their lives. I swear I will be faithful and bear allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, in person and with dignity against all enemies. I will obey all orders of Her Majesty and of the generals and officers set over me. And they mean it. Under an aquiline stare, they are to come face to face, albeit by photograph, with the person to whom they have pledged their very lives. A few weeks ago, many of them were unaware even that the British monarch was a woman. They touched the Union flag, an endorsement of their oath. Who knows what history has in store for them? One young Gurkha couldn't suppress a nervous giggle. He was brusquely admonished, but they do have a sense of humour. A Gurkha would rather laugh than eat. Oh, that, that was the impression that, that uh, we got. Um, they, most of them used to carry catapults, and they would hide. And as you went by, they would, they would snipe you with their catapults. And if you shouted, Idaro, Johnny, I can see you, you know, um, the little head would come out giggling. 
and then he would hold up his, his, his catapult as much as say, this is what I did it with, you know, as if you didn't know. And uh, you couldn't take offence. I mean, you, you just couldn't. It would, it would have probably been very dangerous apart from anything else. Back home, three square meals a day were a mirage. Now, this is the Savoy without the bill. On average, in the first year of training, each recruit grows one and a half inches and puts on a stone. None of it fat. If you find the finger habit mildly off-putting, remember that they've only just got to grips with shoelaces. Knives and forks are on the agenda, but not yet. Anyway, it was only the other day, 1611 in fact, that knives and forks were introduced to England. But why are these men prepared to die for the British crown? It's simple, he says. We've eaten your rations. We've eaten your salt. The obligation is binding. Obviously, there are times in a soldier's life when room service is not available. For example, the Burma jungle in 1944, when the Japanese were being extremely tiresome. So, for a while, it was grilled beetles garnished with imagination. Their colonel-in-chief has suffered similar indigestion. I've never forgotten one, on one visit um, in Hong Kong. I think we were, they were on an exercise in, uh, uh, in one of the sort of junglier parts of Hong Kong. Uh, where I was then invited to to uh, to come and have um, lunch with them, I think, in the jungle. And I then found myself being given snake, which actually was one of the more disgusting things I think I've ever eaten. They sleep on the floor because they always have. And unacquainted with EastEnders, Silla Black, or other icons of British culture, they spend their evening singing songs about Himalayan mountains or hacking people's heads off. <laughs> Local parents, others if they can afford the journey, drop into Pokhara for the farewells. There are also some enterprising young ladies, a Gurkha, even if he is off to Britain for the next three years, is a pretty good catch. But for some, the partings are the worst part of any adventure. Will he ever see his father again? Almost certainly, which is more than can be said for some of the rejected candidates down the years. Their sense of shame was so great that they came to this sinister bridge and threw themselves into the river below. They've now constructed anti-suicide nets. They may be leaving a Shangri-La film set, but they're also departing a world where to be aged and bent is to become a supplicant. <laughs> This man fought with the Gurkhas in World War II. He did the dirty work. But because he didn't serve 15 years, he doesn't qualify for a British Army pension. Body and soul are now held together by the independent Gurkha Welfare Trust. Each month, he receives a £10 handout, sufficient for a few daily handfuls of rice. Nor had the Trust forgotten the widows of their former colleagues in arms. We're talking here of hardship, not hard luck stories. This Gurkha widow lost her husband just after the war and is about to lose the roof over her head. The house was lent to her by relatives who now want to sell it. To augment her ten pounds a month, she was still forced to work. But where now can she find it? Uh, for 30 days, a month. But what she will do, she, she go to the riverside and collect uh, the firewood from the river bank. Uh, normally in the monsoon season, uh, there are lots of them lying either side of the river bank. And you can see her finger collecting piece of wood which lies uh, either side of the river bank. And then uh, uh, she, she can survive. But the problem is obvious. The lady is getting old. 
The star of the festival of Tihar is a cow. It's plied with drink, probably horlicks, and sweetmeats. The cow is sacred here, based on the theory that it's the provider of almost everything, from milk when it's living to leather when it's dead. The god Krishna declared the cow his favorite animal a thousand years ago, which was fortunate. Without the cow, the Gurkhas would have never become soldiers of international renown. This is the Lee Enfield Mark VI muzzle loader. Its cartridges were the problem, allegedly for being sealed with paper contaminated by cow grease. David Harding is an ex Gurkha and Bisley champion. The cartridge for the new rifle was greased at the bullet end. Inside this end of the cartridge there was a bullet of this shape. Uh, in this end there was enough powder for one shot. In the process of loading the sepoy had to bite open the powder end with his teeth so that he could pour the powder into the muzzle. He then reversed the cartridge, pushed the bullet end in, tore off the empty part of the paper and rammed the bullet into the bore. And in the process of biting the cartridge, he would have come in closer contact than he cared for with the grease on the bullet end. The grease was, the rumour was, that it was composed of the fat of pigs and of cows. And the fat of pigs would have been objectionable to the Muslim sepoys, and the fat of cows would have been very objectionable to the Hindu sepoys. And contact with it, um, especially for higher caste Hindus, could cause serious loss of... Um, of caste itself and of uh, could cause social ostracism back in the home village. The British government said, well, get your own grease. But high caste Indians were not to be mollified. They were itching for a fight, believing that the British were crushing their own cultures throughout the land. But the cow grease rumours still persisted. 150 years later, no such taboo was to deflect the young Gurkhas from the obvious venue for their first public meal in Britain. Burger, beef, one. These Gurkhas were serving with the British in India in 1857. At the musketry school in Ambala, they insisted on using the Calgary's cartridge to distance themselves from the whinging Indian troops. But the cow grease rumour continued to fuel the bigger issue. India was seething with anti-British antagonism. The guns were primed for mutiny. <laughs> Delhi, capital of the old Mughal Empire, was the scene of the bloodiest conflict. It was a rising of manic intensity and unspeakable atrocity. Officers were hacked to pieces, their wives, children and servants mutilated before death or thrown live into the city's wells. Major Charles Reed, commander of the Sermor Battalion of Gurkhas, was among those ordered to head to the aid of his beleaguered British colleagues of the 60th Rifles. Within four hours, his relief column was on the way. But the 60th Rifles, pictured here in happier times, as they say, were apprehensive about the Gurkha involvement. Could they trust these Gurkhas, foreign troops after all? They were soon to learn. Fiercely loyal, brave to a man, the Gurkhas actually enjoyed their part in quelling the mutiny. Indeed, when word got abroad, they were accorded the highest of accolades, a rave review in the London Illustrated News. The Fusiliers and a little Gurkha were sitting by a window when one of the enemy, who had concealed himself, popped his head out to see what was doing. He happened to look the other way when the little Gurkha, as quick as thought, whipped out his cookery and sliced his head off in an instant, to the great delight of the Fusiliers, who could not for ten minutes shoulder their muskets for laughing. The cookeries are kept very sharp, and I have seen a Gurkha cutting his corns at arm's length. It is not to be wondered at that these are the dread of the rebels. The few surviving rebels continued to dread. They were simply tied to gun barrels and dispatched to join their holy cow in the sky. Among the heroes of the Gurkhas action was Subadar Major Jesse Rajput with medals. Never again would the integrity of these fighting men from Nepal be questioned.
Their campaigns were commemorated on their chests, and such now was their reputation that Queen Victoria herself intervened, promoting them to a rifle regiment. But rifle regiments don't carry colours, so she presented them with a ceremonial truncheon. The truncheon uh, has been more than a regimental colour to us. In, in our language, uh, it's called Nisani Mai. Uh, little meaning Nisani is a point, and Mai is a uh, mother, if not a goddess. So it's, it's more like a goddess to us than a simple uh, regimental colour. It is a sad and nostalgic day at Sandhurst. This is the last parade of the second Gurkha Rifles bane of the Japanese, now victims of Whitehall defence guns. But to the Gurkhas, the truncheon which evokes such homage is not being laid up. It is being placed in suspended animation against a day, perhaps generations ahead, when there may come another rallying call. It's been so precious to us, and particularly to, for myself, having served um, in the resume for 20 years. And if anybody would want to steal or take away from us, I wouldn't hesitate to draw my cookery and charge. Simple as that. Officers past and present have come to pay their respects and as another icon of British military history goes to the wall, some can't contain a sense of bitterness. If we are to play our part in the United Nations, we should have troops available to, to, to answer that. At the present rate of things, if, if the country were threatened, we'd probably have to send a policeman to Dover to stop the invasion coming in. Even though she's not present in the regiment, she will always be in my heart. And every morning, whenever I perform my religious prayers, I will think about Nishani Mai as well. Ironically, as the old guard leaves, the new recruits land in Britain. They arrive in Gurkha fashion, smart and marching. None had flown before. They've come straight from Kathmandu to a world in which our obvious is their astonishment. You don't even need to walk here, even the pavements move. From Gatwick Airport, they shut their eyes around the M25, always a sensible precaution, to their new home near Aldershot. What's going through their minds? Well, I think it's probably a mixture, of, partly of delight, that of the 57,000 applicants, they've been one of the only 153 that have been selected. And probably also a certain amount of amazement. In Nepal, they often talk of England or Balayat as the place where the gods live. They're now discovering that God lives in a rather cold, very wet environment, and that may be slightly puzzling. <laughs> well, it's warm and dry in the Queen Elizabeth Barracks, Church Crookham, but there are some culture shocks. For most, it's their first night in a bed with springs and a mattress. Next day, there's the tricky introduction to the knife and fork. 
But as with their predecessors, the menu confronts no theological misgivings. Back home, they'd be eating rice and lentils, but the traditional English breakfast presents no problem. They're quick to learn. Two years ago, these Gurkhas were also fumbling with knives and forks. Now they're in Bosnia, operating a sophisticated communication system for the United Nations. But for the new recruits, there is yet more to assimilate, not least the mystery of the urban traffic light. You never see a Gurkha, scruffy, badly turned out. Look at them. They got, and this is a day off. They're mufty, and they're always immaculate. They're a, a credit to their unit and to the British Army, in my view. When they come here, they have an image of our society which probably hasn't existed for 50 years. Um, they assume that all the British are sobs, that there are no criminals in England. Um, that, that everyone behaves in the way that uh, they believe people ought to behave. Um, that, of course, isn't the way that our society operates. Unfortunately, getting money out of a wall requires some coaching. One of their number once entrusted his PIN number to a total stranger, then asked for assistance. In camp, they're being inducted into the use of the fundamental tool of their trade. This is quite a big moment for them because this is the first time they will ever have fired a live round on the range. Today, and I haven't yet been to look at the targets, I would be surprised if there were many who had a group larger than an inch. Now that, at this stage, having never fired a round in their lives before, to get five rounds in a one-inch group is actually very, very good. What's their secret? Good eyesight and doing exactly what they're told. They will absorb the instruction they're given, they'll follow it absolutely, they'll get their breathing right, they'll get their trigger operation right, they're patient, and they'll fire when they're ready to fire. They haven't seen Rambo forms, they don't think they know at all. <laughs> they're starting from scratch, and therefore they'll make very good shots. Well, that's what I was saying. So those are very, very good groups for the first time he's ever fired a shot in his life. Right. He's quite pleased with it, but he's sure he can improve. In fact, it is very, very good, I can tell you. It's quite difficult to improve on it. But, I mean, that's five rounds straight between the eyes. Very happy. <laughs> he says he's very happy to go and kill the enemy. Again, here in Britain, the friendliness between Gurkha officers and men is immediately apparent. One has to remember that a Gurkha unit, in a sense, is a company of equals. I command my men not because I'm a major, but because I have got more experience than they have, I have done more courses, I've been in the army longer, um, they respect me and they obey my orders, but we are a company of equals, and there it would never occur to a Gaka rifleman that there would be any social distinction between the two. If I go to Nepal, I will stay in a soldier's house. Um, if a soldier brings his wife to England for a holiday, quite often she will come and stay in my quarter. Um, and we have had situations in my married quarter where I've had a brigadier, a corporal and a rifleman all staying there at the same time, all with their wives. This is regarded as extraordinary by the rest of the army, uh, but it works in our society. And the British officer has to be able to fit into that. There's no room for the arrogant. There's no room for the patronising. There is no room for the pompous, uh, because that just doesn't wash with the Gaka. The whole thing runs on mutual trust. I trust them, and they trust me. We've got a high proportion of chaps who will have a go at anything and will claim to swim. Some of them will have had a go at swimming at home, largely because they're hoping to get into the army, and they will trek off to the nearest river and they'll jump into a pool uh, and they'll either learn to swim or they'll drown. 
Um, fortunately, most of them appear to, to learn to swim, although it's very much doggy paddle. Again, it's easy to teach a Gak. I keep saying it's easy to teach Gakka things, and, and it is, because he wants to. He's intelligent, and he wants to learn. He also has great faith in the system. So when we say to a Gakka, you are to jump into the swimming pool, which incidentally is eight feet deep, do you understand that? Yes, now jump. He will jump, and he will do exactly what he's told to do, uh, and he will therefore very quickly learn how to swim. And if he sinks to the bottom, we will fish him out, and he'll do it again. And within a day or two, they'll all be swimming quite reasonably. Everything is done to help them settle in. The yak man from Everest, for example, has been missing his yaks. So, on a neighbouring farm, he meets at least a Highland look-alike. Back in genuine yak country, there's a happy ending to a remarkable story. This is the Himalayan home village of the most celebrated living Gurkha. In May 1945, on the banks of the Irrawaddy River, rifleman Lachiman Gurung, here with friends, took on the Japanese literally single-handed. This was because he'd had his right arm blown off. Lachiman was also wounded in the face, chest and legs. He won the day alone and was awarded the Victoria Cross. Age 78 now and walking with some difficulty, he wanted to move from the mountains to a house on the plain. There was an obvious cash flow problem. His income was 56 pounds a month, supplemented by a gift of 100 pounds every year from Eric Williams, a British Gurkha officer who'd fought in the same Irrawaddy action. Then he learned that his Victoria Cross, if offered for auction in a London cell room, could fetch up to 50,000 pounds. But where was it? Mrs. Latchman knew precisely. In 1951, his old Indian Army regiment had asked if they could borrow it and display it as an inspiration to their troops. Just seven years ago, Latchman sent his two sons to India to retrieve it. They returned empty-handed. The Indians had offered to house him in India. Latchman refused. My home is Nepal, he said. And what would happen to my family when I die? The matter had been dragging on now for 44 years. A simple Nepalese hillman against a vast bureaucracy. Latchman's old commander, General Sir Walter Walker, took up the case. There was a heated exchange of letters with the Indians, but still nothing came of it. <laughs> so each month, Latchman's son prepared for the journey down the mountain to collect his pension. No, he's not heavy, he said. How could he be? He's my father. <laughs> <laughs> the pride is understandable, for this is a citation of what his father did to win the Victoria Cross at the age of 17. At Tangdor in Burma, on the west bank of the Irrawaddy, on the night of the 12th, 13th of May, 1945, Rifleman Lachiman Guru was manning the most forward post of his platoon. At 0120 hours, at least 200 enemy assaulted the company's position. The brunt of the attack was borne by Lachiman Gurung's section, and by his own post in particular. Before assaulting, the enemy hurled innumerable grenades at the position from close range. One grenade fell on the lip of Rifleman Lachiman Gurung's trench. He at once grasped it and hurled it back at the enemy. Almost immediately, another grenade fell directly inside the trench. And again, this rifleman snatched it up and threw it back. A third grenade then fell just in front of the trench. He attempted to throw it back, but it exploded in his hand, blowing off the fingers, shattering his right arm, and severely wounding him in the face, body, and right leg. His two comrades were also badly wounded and lay helpless in the bottom of the trench. The enemy, screaming and shouting, now formed up shoulder to shoulder and attempted to rush the position by sheer weight of numbers. Rifleman Lachiman Gurung, regardless of his wounds, loaded and fired his rifle with his left hand, maintaining a continuous rate of fire. Wave after wave of fanatical attacks were thrown in by the enemy, but all were repulsed with heavy casualties. 
For four hours after being severely wounded, Rifleman Lachiman Gurung remained alone, awaiting with perfect calm each attack, meeting it with fire at point-blank range from his rifle, determined not to give one inch of ground. Of 87 enemy dead counted in the immediate vicinity of the company's locality, 31 lay in front of this rifleman's section, the key to the whole position. This rifleman, by his magnificent example, so inspired his comrades to resist the enemy to the last that, although surrounded and cut off for three days and two nights, they held and smashed every attack. His gallant and extreme devotion to duty in the face of almost overwhelming odds were the main factors in the defeat of the enemy. The happy ending is that Lachiman did get his house on the plane. When the story was known, the Gurkha Welfare Trust bought a plot, the British Limbless Ex-Servicemen's Association chipped in a donation, and the readers of a British newspaper sent in more than £100,000, not only for Lachiman, but for other Gurkhas on hard times. Incidentally, the Indians turned up for Lachiman's housewarming. They gave him £8,000 in lieu of his VC. Quite by chance, at Church Crookham, a piper is practising. He is playing Ode to Joy. Today, from the wreckage of five infantry battalions, one new regiment, the Royal Gurkha Rifles, is being raised. The Gurkhas are now serving with the 5th Airborne Brigade and other specialised units of the British Army. The man honoured and delighted to become their Colonel-in-Chief is the Prince of Wales. They march at a brisk 140 paces a minute, exemplifying 50 years on the words of Field Marshal Bill Slim, commander of the 14th Army which won the war in Burma. Nothing looks as uniform as a Gurkha battalion. Nothing looks more workmanlike and few things look so formidable. They have the most remarkable, um, I think, approach to life. I mean, they're the loyalest people in the world, apart from anything else. And I suppose from the point of view of, of, of uh, a military existence, so many of them are ready-made for it because they come from um, martial clans in, in, in Nepal. And some of the clans, you know, have this particular tradition of being the warriors. And I think that's what, I suppose, makes them such wonderful soldiers. But they have such a good sense of humour, and they're really sort of noble people, I think. I, I just think they're remarkable people. I'm very fond of them. Many have tried to enshrine the Gurkha character. Here are the words of Sir Rolf Turner, a former Gurkha officer. Once more, I hear the laughter with which you greeted every hardship. Uncomplaining, you endure hunger and thirst and wounds. And at the last, your unwavering lines disappear into the smoke and wrath of battle. Bravest of the brave, most generous of the generous, never had a country more faithful friends than you.